Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. We couldn't ask for a more authoritative commentator who was a key player in the development of highly stealthy aircraft technology and widely recognized among the pioneers of stealth to celebrate today one of the seminal programs in the development of stealth aircraft technology, we have Don Murray, who will share with us Tacit Blue. Hi, my name's Don Murray. I was, I've been involved with at least 12 uh, new airplane programs in my 50 years with Northrop. Uh, several of them were very unique, probably none more so than the Tacit Blue program. Uh, Tacit Blue was a technology demonstrator developed by Northrop in the early 80s. Uh, for a DARPA project. The objective was to demonstrate battlefield survivability of a highly low observable airplane that incorporated a low probability of interception search radar in a battlefield environment. The flight program ran from February of 1982 through June of 1985. The program involved about 140 flights, and the total test flying time was around 250 hours. The program was very highly classified. The vehicle was site sensitive. Uh, at the time, uh, a lot of us didn't know the objectives of the program. We were just uh, there to make sure we had a safe uh, flight test program and obtain quality flight test data. This is a model of the uh, North of Tacit Blue Airplane. The North of Designation was AP-1, Advanced Projects Number 1. It had a wingspan of uh, 48 feet. It was 58 feet long. The uh, wing uh, incorporated a Clark Y airfoil, which is something you don't normally associate with modern airplanes. That was a 1930s design for low-powered airplanes and needed a lot of lift. But uh, for this battlefield surveillance application, endurance was a big thing, and the engineers felt that Clark Y was the proper airfoil for that application. The wing structure and the basic fuselage structure is made out of a standard 7075 uh, aluminum alloy. The V-tails and the wing edges and the fuselage uh, edges are a proprietary Northrop composite material. Uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, and this airplane wasn't beautiful, but, it, but every aspect of it performed admirably during this program. The uh, airplane had one crew member, one pilot, two turbofan engines. It incorporated the nose gear of an F5E fighter and the main gear off F-16 fighters. And that combination all worked out well. Um, the airplane had a quad-redundant fly-by-wire flight control system. A hydraulic power was 4, 000, a 4,000 PSI system. It doesn't take a PhD in aeronautical engineering to realize that this sort of edge treatment on the nose and the huge side area forward of the CG for the LPI radar dish uh, does terrible things to the flying qualities of a, of a normal airplane, hence the quad-redundant flight control system. Okay, to summarize, the airplane weighed 30,000 pounds at takeoff. Uh, the ultimate load factor was around three Gs, so it was not, on purpose, a very highly maneuverable airplane. Like on most prototype airplane programs, the airplanes tend to take on their own names. Uh, their own slang names. Uh, the first one that the AP-1 had was the whale because of the shape of the horizontal V-tails. They're not actually horizontal, but the V-tails. And the second one was the alien school bus because of the large slab sides forward of the uh, CG where the LPI antennas were located. Now I'd like to go through uh, the general major items of the program history. Uh, I, I was involved from first in January of 1981 uh, the basic airplane structure had been completed and assembled, and we were involved with installing various components uh, and the line runs for hydraulics, fuel, uh, line runs for the throttle system, and of course the wire bundles associated with the flight control system. In September 1981, the 
aircraft was essentially completed and it was transported to the test site. Uh, between then and February of 1982, we completed in-hangar checks of all the systems. Uh, we verified the flight control laws and the uh, backup procedures to be used in case of a flight control malfunction. We did a series of engine runs. Most, if not all, of these activities were done inside a hangar because of the site sensitivity uh, aspects of the airplane. We even did uh, low and high powered engine runs inside the hangar. Uh, we uh, towed out for certain uh, low of observable information acquisition. And of course, we were outside for the low and high speed taxi test. A um, critical point in the taxi test was an axle to 105 knots where the, where the controls laws uh, changed and we had a fade in, fade out uh, situation that had to occur at a certain airspeed so the airplane would maintain a stable rotation and liftoff uh, attitude. The uh, first flight was in February of 1982 and it was followed by approximately 40 flights to uh, for basic airworthiness and to calibrate the uh, flush pedostatic system and to do the initial series of low observable measurements. All those test objectives were met during those 40 flights and we were impressed about the reliability of this airplane being a one-off prototype vehicle. In September of 1982, the airplane was put down to install the LPI radar system. Those tests continued on until mid-June of 1985 and uh, proved to be very successful. The airplane was transferred to the uh, Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio in uh, 2013. And uh, if you want to see it, it's under the wing of the XP-70 in Hangar 4. When I joined the program in January of 1981, of course, a tremendous amount of work had, had preceded this. The, uh, research, design, and development for most of the vehicle and the associated subsystems. Uh, from January 1981 until the uh, September 81 transfer of the vehicle to the test site, uh, myself and uh, a half a dozen other engineers who had been involved with uh, Eliason Engineering and uh, detailed design uh, created a bunch of engineering for the uh, details of how we're gonna route all the cabling through the airplane, hydraulic lines, and uh, how we're gonna mount the instrumentation, flight test instrumentation, and, and, and so forth. The uh, design effort I was involved with was a, a typical skunk works operation to take the word from our Lockheed friends. And the engineering was uh, detailed and complete, but, a, um, but we used a uh, abbreviated approval system through uh, structures and uh, integration design people. My main uh, job assignment on this program was to be second shift manager at the test site. And that, of course, started in September of 1981. Uh, we were involved, heavily involved with the uh, uh, final installation of, of details, uh, calibration of instrumentation, uh, verification of the flight control laws, as I mentioned, and uh, the engine running activity prior to taxi and first flight. Some of the problems that we encountered during the uh, ground testing, uh, the first one was that you couldn't start both engines without starting them both at once. The inlet did not have a splitter, so when the first engine got started, it was hogging up all the air and it was not enough to, to crank the second engine. Uh, the engines were powered by uh, electrical starters so we came up with something we call the almost simultaneous start with the appropriate acronym. What we would do is get the first engine cranking and before it lit off, we'd crank the second engine. And so they more or less lit off and spooled up to idle speed at the same time. Now the electrical requirement is so high, while this was going on, the lights dimmed not only in our facility, but every other facility on base. So everybody could tell when we were starting engines. The second uh, series of problems we encountered during ground tests was uh, dynamic resonance in the uh, hydraulic lines associated with the 4,000 PSI flight control system. Now we're all aware of the problem the F-14 had on its first flight with uh, hydraulic line resonance. 
and we were trying to be very careful with our routing and clamping of our hydraulic lines so we didn't encounter a similar problem. We almost got it right, except for the connections that uh, apply to the fittings where you service hydraulic system. Uh, we rented the airplane one night and we heard this high pitched high pitch squeal and we dove out from under the airplane just in time to avoid being boiled by 4,000 PSI hydraulic fluid at a very high temperature. Anyway, there's some engineering involved with uh, rerouting and reclamping and uh, getting the dynamics engineers involved uh, to make sure we had done the right thing. We had no further problems throughout the program with the hydraulic system. One of the other problems we encountered during the pre-flight activity was uh, attaining the uh, smoothness and curvature on the fuselage to uh, satisfy uh, low absorbable requirements. We used a auto body filler called Bondo for this function. We'd used it 20 years earlier on the X-21 laminar flow control airplane to smooth the wings so we could demonstrate laminar flow control of the boundary layer and decreasing the parasite drag. We had a joke that if we ever lost our jobs, we could always get a job with the car customizers in the LA area sanding Bondo because everybody got a chance to apply and sand Bondo in both those programs. As a second shift supervisor, uh, one of my other jobs was acting as pilot uh, while the flight control guys were, were fine tuning the flight control laws on the airplane. They had a flight simulator hooked into the airplane outside and I would sit in the cockpit and fly the airplane, if you will. Um, we, uh, with all four flight control computers working properly, the airplane flew just like any other uh, airplane. No, no problems. The Cooper Harper rating was probably one or two. Very pleasant to fly, actually. But then the flight, the flight control engineers would um, start uh, deactivating certain portions of the uh, computers. With uh, three computers operating, we were getting down near the midpoint on the Cooper Harper scale, four or five. It was very difficult to maintain straight and level flight. And when it got down to two computers, uh, it was almost impossible to maintain heading or pitch attitude. And uh, with just one computer operating, the airplane was totally unflyable, which is something you would expect with a large amount of side area forward of the CG due to the uh, LPI installation and with the uh, edge configuration on the nose of the airplane. The program produced some very valuable data, both in the low observable field and in the uh, radar field that was used in later programs. The, uh, Low observable pedostatic system was applied to the B-2 airplane. Uh, some of the stealth qualities were also applied to the B-2 airplane and the tri-service standoff missile and some other vehicles that came along later. The LPI radar system went on to become uh, the major sensor in the E-8 J-STARS airplane currently flying today. Some final recollections uh, for my involvement in the program, I remember one of the vice presidents saying that the AP-1 was the most unstable airplane ever designed up to that point. Uh, that's why we needed the, the quadrant joint flight control system. If any of you have ever flown the flight, flight simulator of the Wright Flyer, this airplane with only one computer flew a lot like the Wright Flyer. We never had any engine problems uh, I remember one night, though, we did have to change an engine. I forget the reason why. But these engines, though, they're a brand new design and, and unique uh, for other applications. Uh, they leaked oil like a large radial piston engine. Uh, I didn't remember how bad that was in my previous life dealing with R2800s, but this thing reminded me a whole lot of an R2800 and its oil leaking problem. Some recollections from my involvement in the program. Uh, we were all paid very well. It was a 24-7 operation. We worked very long hours. And uh, I just as soon uh, not go to that test site again. Thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to our recollections of the Tacit Blue program from uh, here at the Western Museum of Flight. And you all have a good day.